wonderful uh, presentations by Pio in a couple, by Pablo and uh, We had three scheduled as of right now. We only have two of our presenters. Uh, so we're going to start it off with Be the Street. Uh, Hi, I'm Anna Puga. I teach at Ohio State. And um, I have been working on this project, Be the Street, for the last three years. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is the very first time that I've presented about it because I've been so busy trying to make it go that I haven't had time to really reflect on it in any kind of sustained way other than uh, doing production dramaturgy notes for the project because I was, um, besides being the principal investigator, the co-dramaturg. And so um, that's taken up most of my time. So I'm happy to share this work with you. It's very preliminary, and I'm very open to suggestions on which, because uh, I talk about four ethical issues, which of these issues seems to you to be most fruitful for exploring in a published article. And uh, if you have any readings that you would suggest to me, because I engage very lightly with theory at this point, I'm also really happy to take any suggestions. So thank you. OK, so I'm going to start with the quotation from a poem by Bertolt Brecht, a quotation from which our project took its name. Uh, and this is a poem called Speech to the Danish Working Class Actors on the Art of Observation. So your schooling must begin among living people. Let your first work be your Oh, sorry. Let your first school be your place of work, your dwelling, your part of the town. Be the street, the underground, the shops. You should observe all the people there as strangers as if they were acquaintances, but acquaintances as if they were strangers to you. <laughs> what is Be the Street? Be the Street takes place in the underserved West Columbus neighborhood known as the Hilltop. Uh, space park. Space bar to move the slides? Okay, cool. <laughs> the median annual household income in this hilltop is a little less than $40,000, about $10,000 less than Columbus's median income. And this is Columbus, Ohio. The neighborhood occupies a sprawling geographical area with a population of almost 64,000 people spread over 12.5 square miles. We chose the hilltop for our community engaged device theater project because we were interested in exploring issues of migration, mobility, and placemaking with a diverse population. The Hilltop has long-standing African-American and Appalachian populations, as well as more recent African and Latino immigrant populations. Beaver Street was formed by half a dozen faculty members from four departments and a center at OSU, theater, dance, Spanish and Portuguese, comparative studies, and the Center for Folklore Studies. We wanted to pursue our research interests in performance, migration, storytelling, and placemaking with community participants. We wanted to work with participants in their community, not on campus. And we wanted to find ways to get their stories out in front of audiences composed of both their fellow Hilltop community members and OSU community members. We wanted to train our graduate students in ethnography and devised theater. And we wanted to contribute to OSU's growing reputation as a place where graduate students can study and practice cutting-edge devised theater techniques. We applied for and received a grant from the University's Humanities and Arts Discovery Themes and received $100,000 for a two-year pilot program starting in the fall of 2016. We were funded again with $20,000 grants in 2018 and 2019, and as I said, I'm the principal investigator and dramaturg for the project. First ethical issue, why do this? <laughs> in theater of good intentions, uh, Danny Snyder Young asks theater practitioners to consider, quote, whether theater is indeed the intervention needed to make the change for which they fight, close quote. This is the first ethical consideration that my colleagues at The Ohio State University and I pondered as we sat down over coffee to chat about applying for a grant to create a community-engaged device theater program. After all, it wasn't as if the people of Hilltop were crying out for more theater in their community. No one had asked us to create a theater program with them. In conversations about the neighborhood, in fact, residents mostly voiced a desire for better economic opportunities, a more peaceful environment, and a better public school system. While I won't speak for the other faculty members, I will admit that just as much as I wanted to improve the lives of the people of the Hilltop, I was selfishly motivated by my desire to get off campus and pursue my research interests in migration, mobility, and placemaking. <laughs> 
while engaging in the practice of dramaturgy. I thought, and maybe even said aloud, something like, well, the experience of devising theater probably won't hurt people, and it might help build community and promote interaction among diverse groups of people. As Michael Balfour notes in The Politics of Intention, looking for a theater of little changes, funding institutions sometimes pressure theater practitioners to promise more than theater can actually be expected to deliver, to promise transformative individual growth or social progress. The Discovery Theme Grant application at OSU indeed asked us to demonstrate how we would address real world problems. We vowed to earn national and international recognition for OSU as an incubator of civically engaged performance, bringing together eminent artists and community groups to nurture vibrant dialogue, shape policy, and improve quality of life. Four years later, <coughs> I can say that we have promoted some vibrant dialogue and maybe improved a few people's quality of life, at least for a while, but we haven't shaped any policy yet. In an attempt to promote vibrant dialogue, the project's first artistic director, Shalorna Stokes, who teaches at Yale now, came up with a structure that was based in her own research on pageants. Form various groups with different partner organizations, and then bring the groups together for a public sharing of work in which each group's piece, uh, each group's piece forms an act in a loosely connected performance whole. This structure has the advantages of promoting interaction both within each ensemble and potentially across different ensembles, if the project brings the different ensembles together early in the workshop phase before moving into rehearsals and public performance. In practice, the logistics of bringing the ensembles together early in the process can be difficult. Schedule conflicts, transportation, childcare, and so forth. Yet we did make an effort and are committed to making more of an effort in the future. Second ethical issue, and you'll see a pattern here where I tend to bring up these problems and come to very tentative, if any, kind of resolution or just end without any resolution at all. Um, recruiting participants, how do you attract them? What do you tell them? And when do you tell them? Do you pay them? How much do you pay them? Do you pay someone who's undocumented with no social security number? And if so, how? As a Mexican-American with a joint appointment in the Departments of Spanish and Portuguese who teaches migration and who researches migration and performance, I was drawn to potential participants from Hilltop's Latin American population, and I longed to hear their stories of migration and survival. Was this appropriate intellectual curiosity, a desire to nurture self-expression, or a colonial impulse to appropriate the painful experiences of others? Whatever the motive or mix of motives, on many Saturdays, I found myself in a flea market in Hilltop trying to convince parents and grandparents to let their teenage children stop working their booths for an hour and allow them to participate in a theater workshop, a workshop that we were going to hold right there in the flea market in between the cosmetics area and the old coin counter. Some parents were understandably reluctant to make do without their children's labor. Others were suspicious. Where were we taking their kid? Who would lead the workshop? While we managed to pull together a few workshops in the flea market, it required far too much energy and persuasion for what sometimes turned out to be just three, two, one, or no participants. In the end, my colleague Paloma Martinez Cruz uh, had a far more practical idea. We went to the Our Lady of Guadalupe Center, where OSU already had volunteers working in a food bank under the supervision of another OSU faculty member, and approached the center's director about holding workshops there. Soon we had a stable group of eight or so participants, ranging in age from an infant to a 66-year-old. Lesson learned. Oh, I do have a lesson here. <laughs> Take advantage of the resources you already have, and don't bang your head against the wall trying to convince people to accept something that they may not want or need. As other groups formed at the YMCA, at the Hilltop branch of the Columbus Public Library at West High School, at Clean Turn Cleaning Service. And I'm going to show you some images. What we did was we just started offering workshops in the community uh, with no commitment necessary. And then after a while, uh, the workshops in, with some organizations morphed into ensembles. And with other organizations, they just remain one-off, or in some cases, like with the middle school, we, we did about 30, 40, 50 workshops there, and it never became an ensemble because we couldn't get uh, the consent form signed by the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, as other groups formed, 
We were faced with the question of whether to tell people from the start that we were considering a public performance at the end of the semester. On the one hand, full disclosure seemed fair and honest. On the other hand, we didn't want to frighten away potential participants. And on the third hand, we wanted to be sure that if the workshop process seemed more valuable to the group than the performance product, that we could in the end opt out of the performance without that seeming like a negative judgment on the participants' work. In the end, we decided that we would have a public sharing only if the participants wanted to go ahead with it, and we told them so from the start. Yet, we also offered a carrot, a $300 payment for participants who rehearsed and performed. Was this bribery or a token compensation, a way of investing in the Hilltop community, or a way of ensuring that our funders could consume a product at the end, right? And then say, oh, this is fabulous work. Yes, we'll give you more money for next year. Why $300 for seeing the process through to performance, but not just for attending a certain number of workshops? The first year of the public performance, 2018, we didn't tell participants about the payment at the start of the process for fear that some people might participate only because of the money. The second year of the performance, 2019, we told participants about the payment from the start, and it didn't seem to make any difference. People came and went from the groups at about the same rate as the year before. So it seemed that our fear that some participants might stick with the project solely for the money was unfounded. And in thinking about it a bit more deeply, so what? So what if some people did participate only for the money? Who are we to police participants' motivations? Right? Okay, third ethical issue. Uh, third ethical issue, devising topics. Do you accentuate the positive and the beautiful as James Thompson urges in performance effects? Or do you tackle the problematic head-on as a long series of theorists that practitioners have urged from Brett and Boal to Michael Road? On the one hand, the Hilltop faces many social challenges, drug addiction, human trafficking, school violence, street crime, and the aforementioned economic and educational opportunities, lack of economic and educational opportunities. Powerful theater can be created from addressing these issues. Yet on the other hand, that is not the entirety of the Hilltop, as one might be led to believe from local media reports. There's also much to celebrate in the neighborhood. Gardens, murals, families, friendships, solidarity, and entrepreneurial efforts. In the end, different ensembles took different approaches, depending in part on the goals of the graduate student and faculty facilitators, as well as on the attitudes of the artistic director. And because we changed artistic director from one year to the next. So the, the second artistic director, I think, is much more focused on the celebratory mm -hmm. than necessarily at, um, addressing problematic issues. When facilitators use a participant's story for a devised performance, a story involving a social problem faced by the participant, to what extent are the facilitators morally obligated to intervene to solve or at least ameliorate the problem? It's easy to tell ourselves that we're not social workers or psychologists <coughs> or high school administrators, yet when a high school girl who was regularly followed home from school and bullied told her story during one of our workshops, one graduate student facilitator felt a responsibility to research possible solutions. Not just an individual solution for that girl, but a systemic solution that might work for at least a portion of the neighborhood. The facilitator found that in some neighborhoods, grandparents had been purposefully recruited as crossing guards in order to watch out for and attempt to prevent bullying. That seemed like a creative solution. The facilitator approached a faculty member, not me, about the issue mm -hmm. and the possible solution. They talked about it, yet concluded that it was unlikely that the administrators at the participants' high school would be willing to work on implementing such a plan. The subject was dropped, the semester ended, and the girl may or may not still be being tormented by bullies. She no longer participates in Beat the Street. Yet her testimony about violence in her community, along with her theater teacher's testimony about school violence and school lockdowns, not only constituted one of the most powerful moments of 2018's final performance, it became part of the final video of the performance, which is now on our website and helps publicize our program. So not only did Street not help ameliorate the problem of bullying or school violence more generally, the project, in a sense, continues to profit from the victimization of one of our participants. And now, I don't know if I'm furthering the victimization or helping by ethically addressing, trying to address this ethical issue, but I'm going to show you the clip from the video. <laughs> uh, 
which is a, a space that the university rents on the outskirts of Hilltop. It's an, actually the next neighborhood over. And the first year we had our final performance in a cafe, uh, but the cafe turned into a bookstore cafe and all the space got eaten up had bookshelves. So the next year uh, we couldn't find a space actually in the community, so we did it in the space that's like right next to the community. Okay, fourth uh, ethical issue, communication with participants. How am I doing on time? What? Okay. <laughs> Do you set policies and procedures for communication between community participants and faculty facilitators, or do you allow communication to proceed on an informal basis? How do you react if participants reach out to you for additional contact in a context outside of the project? During the first two years of Be the Street, the artistic director and I had no set policy for communication with participants. One teenage participant began to text and email us about her personal life, mostly texts about her family conflicts, her pets, and her emotional struggles. Because the communication didn't bother me, I never asked her to stop, and sometimes replied to her texts with brief encouraging texts, or what I hoped were encouraging texts of my own. The third year, the artistic directorship shifted to a new person, whom the participants soon began to email about personal matters. The new artistic director interpreted the emails as an inappropriate breach of boundaries. This led to a discussion of whether faculty involved in the project could each have a different practice of communication with participants, or whether the project needs a communication policy. On the one hand, and you see this is another pattern in this talk, I have one hand, second hand, sometimes a third hand. <laughs> On the one hand, I dislike the idea of institutionalizing communication, and thought that the matter could be easily handled on an individual basis. If you don't want to receive texts or emails from someone, ask them to stop or even block them if necessary. On the other hand, I began to consider whether accepting the texts was a positive outlet and source of support for the team, 
or whether it was creating a kind of dependency that might somehow prove detrimental to her in the long run. And inevitably, since I work for an academic institution, I began to engage in cover your ass thinking. <laughs> And what if I'm violating a university rule or policy by communicating by text about personal matters with an OSU program participant? I checked with our university's youth protection program consultant and was told that texting an email is not covered by university policy, but that she personally would recommend a project policy that a parent always be copied when emailing or texting with a minor in one of our programs. Moreover, she forwarded a sample of a project communication policy in which any one-on-one -on -one text or email communications with minors is prohibited. When I forwarded the message from the Youth Protection Program consultant to the team to get her thoughts without a CC to her parent, but asking her for her parent's email address so that I could CC the parent in the future, <coughs> she replied, I've been meaning not to be as annoying via phone anyways. I've already managed it with most people, so I'll just archive your number and not worry about it on my end. Haven't heard from her since. In some ways, I'm relieved. This is safer for me. More importantly, I understand the need to protect minors from certain kinds of conversations. Still, I also feel that it's too bad that we have reached a point, at least in the United States, where minors have been so abused by teachers, coaches, doctors, priests, and pop stars, among others, that we can no longer trust adults to communicate one-on-one -on -one with minors who are not their own children. As a devised theater program that includes minors, are we only responsible for the minor as program participants? Regardless of what they may be experiencing in life as a human being outside of the program that benefits our institution, does a policy that all interactions revolve around the program with a CC to the parent really serve the best interests of the minor participants, or does it simply attempt to protect the institution and its employees? I leave you with questions rather than answers. Thank you. <laughs> So we'll get ready and uh, Jess, if you could move over and yeah, set up your chat. presentation <laughs> on, the, on the wall. So we're going to go from one paper to the next and then we're going to open it up for conversations and you'll have both of these papers in your mind working with each other. Questions that were posed by Anna might have even more difficult questions and solutions uh, that Jess offers up. But while we're getting ready, I would just like to take a moment and reiterate some of those ethical questions that you brought up. Yeah. Um, so that we can have them percolating while we go into Jess's presentation. So as I heard them, in kind of mm -hmm. briefer words, mm -hmm. we have how do we do this, how do we start a project mm -hmm. that engages with the community. The second ethical question, how do we find and communicate with our participants? Mm -hmm. uh, or rather, how do we find and interact with our participants? Mm -hmm. The third ethical issue was about communication. Uh, the third one was about devising topics. topics. So maybe the third one, maybe I, that would be a better order. <laughs> yeah. Revising this talk, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> devising topics, how do you, and, and who has the power, which is something that I didn't go into a lot yet, but mm -hmm. to what extent do participants have the power to determine what it's going to be about, and to what extent do facilitators have that power? And then the responsibilities around communication. Mm -hmm. It actually sounds like, too, there's maybe a fifth set of ethical questions around working with minors specifically and your responsibility with them and how far does that go beyond communication, too. Right. Um, yeah, it was, thank you. That was really interesting. And it's, it's I'm really, uh, hi, I'm Jess, and I'm really happy to be here uh, chatting about this work that I've been up to because I think you and I are wrestling with a lot of the same questions. Um, so uh, I'm Jess Kaufman. I'm one of the lead artists and the lead producer on a project called Beyond the Wall. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, great. Um, I'm she, her, hers. I'm based in New York, and the work I'm going to talk to you about today happens at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, so I'm going to present the work of the group and give you a brief uh, history of what we've been up to for the last couple of years. Um, but I'm going to do it through the lens of some key dramaturgical questions that have come up. Uh, my practice is I'm a dramaturg and a creative producer and frequently like the instigating or generating artist in the work that I do. Um, and so I've been, you know, framing this project with my collaborators through these kind of key dramaturgical questions. 
And I'm hoping that at the end, we'll have some time to chat and that this room full of dramaturgical minds can help me uh, engage and brainstorm some of the questions we're wrestling with right now, uh, which there's a lot of overlap. So of I'm really happy that these Good. two things are in conversation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I specialize in Latin American theater performance. Yes. So. Excellent. <laughs> That's what they remind us. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm going to dive in and start with the history of the project, how it came to be, and um, see where we go from there. So um, back in uh, 2017, Trump was being inaugurated that January, and I was not particularly wanting to think about it, so I decided to cheer myself up by taking a young friend to the playground in Brooklyn. Um, and as you can see, as those of you, some of you may know, uh, the trees in Brooklyn have fences around them, and they protect the trees. And uh, so she and I went to the playground and we ran into a friend of hers from kindergarten and the kids started playing with the fence around the tree and the dad and I were talking politics and at some point I looked over, saw these two kids playing with this fence and thought, ah, oh, what if we make giant puppets of children or of people at a scale that we can turn the border wall into an object of play or turn it into a toy and give people a chance to reconsider their relationship with that site. Um, so, yes, this is my child. Uh, <laughs> fence and that's uh, one of our puppets floor. Um, so lucky for me, I know a Mexican puppeteer from grad school uh, and I gave her a call and said, you know, is this insane? And she went, yes, it's insane, but we should try it anyway. <laughs> that's on. So um, this first question that Anna really brought up, she said, you know, we should get the community involved. And um, we decided to look for local participants at whatever site we chose to help build and operate the puppets with us because we're looking at this question of, you know, can we and how can we? As outsiders to a community, Anna's from Mexico City, I'm from the East Coast. Neither of us is from the border or had spent much time there. And uh, there's a big problem in those areas where lots of artists want to make work and they go down there and they use the city as a backdrop and they don't make an investment in the community. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't doing that. Uh, but so how can we as outsiders make something of value to this community that has lasting impact beyond just one performance of puppetry? Uh, so that's kind of how we were framing things in the first year. Um, so, our first real practical question was, how do we find a location? Where should we do this? And um, so we wrote up a little brief and reached out to our networks. Um, Anna has a pretty extensive puppetry network, and I, being uh, an East Coast person of middle, upper middle class, have a lot of political people in my family. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were able to, through an aunt of mine who's an activist here in Chicago, reach some folks from the DNC who put us in touch with folks in Arizona, and suddenly we were chatting with a political organizer from the Phoenix area, and you know, we got on the phone, and the first thing she said was, Nogales, you have to do this in this town, Nogales. It's the perfect place to do what you're talking about. Um, and you know, we were thinking at this time about reframing the wall as an object of play and trying to explore you know, the liminality of the border itself, countering this idea that, you know, uh, I think we're taught to think that a border is a hard line, and there are Mexicans on one side and Americans on the other, and they're different, and they butt up against each other. And really, if you think about it, that's obviously not true. It's a liminal space. Borderlands culture is its own unique blend. Um, it's not how it's conceived or presented in a bigger picture. Um, so this wonderful woman who helped us, her name is Ulima, um, she told us all about Nogales. She went and did a little tour of it and filmed it for us so that we could see. Um, and uh, through her and some of those other national level connections, we were able to be in touch with Border Patrol and the Department of Homeland Security, who has a cultural affairs division. Um, so we were able to talk to them about some of the logistics. Um, and this, just as a side note, rep uh, brought up a big theme in this work for me, myself, as one of the instigating artists, which is what are the ways that I can leverage the privilege I have in service of an idea without being like, I'm going to come and bring you my resources, you know? So how can we combat that condescension while still making use of the resources and connections that I lucked into having? Um, so that's where Nogales is. It's in Arizona. It's about uh, an hour drive south of Tucson. And it's one of the only cities, uh, most cities along the border have a sister city uh, across. So there are lots of you know, sister cities um, all along the US-Mexico border. Nogales is somewhat unique in that the border actually runs through the middle of the town. So half of the city is in Arizona and half is in the Mexican state of Sonora. And uh, both towns are called Nogales. They have separate local governments, but both towns have this motto of Amos Nogales, Nogales together. And there's a real attitude from the community that it's one community. And of course, it's, it's not that simple. It's a very complicated place. Um, but uh, Zuli thought that this would be the right place for us because there's a lot of positivity and feelings of togetherness in the area. Um, that's a picture of the town. Slightly exploitative picture, um, but you can see on one side is the Mexican side of the town, and on the other, on the left, is the 
uh, American side of the town, and that in the middle you can see is the U.S.-Mexico border wall, which is already existing. Um, right now, uh, what you're seeing is this kind of dark brown, it's called Bollard Wall, so it looks kind of like prison bars. Um, you can see through it, you could reach an arm through it if you were allowed to, but you couldn't get a body through it. Um, so that's been there for a long time, already existing, so when people are talking about build a wall, they're actually talking about replace a wall that's already there with a bigger, scarier wall. Um, so once we had our location, we decided to build a prototype. A friend of ours was kind enough to give us residency space on Governor's Island in New York. We got Anna an artist visa, a P3 exchange visa. The process of that was a whole nother foray into borders in our lives and how they manifest in different spaces. Uh, it took us about four months and probably a third of our initial budget that first year just to get that visa for her. Um, so she came to New York and we built, oh, I should do this that way. Uh, we built a prototype puppet. We invited a, a puppeteer and kinetic sculpture artist from Connecticut to come and join us, Anne Coverley. She taught us some of her techniques. Anna brought stuff that, do you know Anne? Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, she's awesome. Uh, so she came and stayed with us for two days on Governor's Island and uh, taught us some of her building techniques. Anna had some stuff that she learned in Prague and abroad uh, and in France because she travels. Um, and we ended up with a prototype puppet named, which we call Floor. Um, we did a little work in progress showing. That's a picture of Floor's head. It's enormous. She's about uh, 15 feet tall, fully assembled. The head alone is uh, a little, it's about 40 inches tall. Um, so one of the things that's really nifty about puppets is that you don't know who they are and what they're good at until you bring them to life. And uh, the day we did the work in progress showing with Floor, the day that photo was taken, we discovered that um, this puppet design, these puppets were really great at high-fiving little kids and really great <laughs> at dancing. And uh, people's reactions were overwhelmingly positive and delighted. Only one or two small children cry. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it was really, it was an artistic turning point for me as a dramaturg and for Anna and I as collaborators to observe and say, oh, well, this is what she's good at. So this project is probably about celebration. And how can we then frame this as a celebration of the positive? And as we were doing research and getting to know Nogales, most of the news that comes out around the border, most of the information that we have access to outside the area is negative. Um, some of it's factual, some of it's skewed, but there's very little positive press coming out about all the great things that happen at the border. And it was really interesting to think about what it might be like to live in a town where everybody knows you as, oh, that super dangerous place where Border Patrol deports people and people are passing drugs through the wall. Um, and so we're really looking for a way to use the puppets in their natural celebratory state to uh, draw some positive media attention and some positive local attention to the great aspects of that area and what its unique blended culture has to offer and teach the rest of us. Um, so meanwhile, uh, we were connected to two local organizers, um, arts and, and uh, economic organizers in Nogales, one on either side of the town. Uh, we met a man named Raul Leva on the Mexican side of Nogales. He's a journalist, he's worked there for about 20 years, and he's also an arts presenter and promoter. And we were connected to Stephanie Bermudez, who is um, an entrepreneur and a mentor and a young business leader in the town of Nogales, Arizona. And each of them we met separately, and each of them separately said, oh, I used to have, my organization or my group used to have this festival. I was thinking about bringing my festival back, but I wasn't going to do it this year. So we heard that from both of them and thought, oh, well, what if we just combine forces? Would you be interested in that? And they both said yes. And all of a sudden, we went from a puppetry performance to a binational day-long festival, uh, which was super cool. And uh, they were both really game, and uh, it was a very fruitful collaboration. Um, so again, that's one of the principles that we're trying to really focus on in this work throughout, and I hope that we'll see this as a theme and something we're trying to learn how to do better, is how do we, instead of imposing an agenda, we want to do a puppetry performance going in and saying, okay, well, what do you want? What is interesting to the community? What's valuable to the community? And how can I then leverage my resources to help facilitate that? Um, and this was one of the first moments where we discovered that thinking. Um, so uh, we made our way down to Nogales for the festival. It was November of 2017. Uh, the project had been, I initiated it with Anna in February of 2017, and. Uh, we made the festival in November, which was a crazy short time frame. Uh, we drove across the country in less than four days in a minivan with puppets, and a good friend of mine named Talia Shalif, she's the one who had given us residency space, she decided she wanted to come along the day before, and I was like, sure, bring her back, hop in the car. Do you drive? Um, so we made this crazy journey, and the whole way, this whole concept, right, we're gonna go down there, 
We're going to have local participants build these puppets with us to amplify their voices, amplify their experiences, and create something big and beautiful and celebratory that pushes back against the narrative on this town. But we didn't have any confirmed participants. Mm -hmm. So we're driving across the country making Facebook videos, making phone calls, reaching out to people we had partnered with, organizations we wanted to partner with but hadn't gotten a hold of, trying to get some people. And we got all the way to Nogales and didn't have anyone confirmed. Mm -hmm. uh, so our, we had about four days to build the puppets. We were planning to make five, mid five. Um, and we had two, one pre-built and one partially built. So it was a lot of work. Um, and we just kind of got started. We had been lucky enough to get some residency space on the roof of an art gallery museum in the area called the Museo de Arte Sonora. It's about a block south of the border crossing, right in the middle of downtown on the Mexico side, super visible, and we were up on the roof building 15 foot tall puppets, and people kept like looking and saying, like, what are they doing? Who is that? Um, and our whole first day, we had nobody. And towards the end of that first day, a couple people who knew Raul came and just kind of, they were like just checking us out to see what we were doing. Um, it was these two women, Jack Subele Gonzalez and Elena Vega, both of whom are artists, they're both moms, they're both feminists, and they're super rad people. And they both came to check it out and they said, oh cool, well we're going to call some of our friends and see if we can get you some participants. The next day, Elena came back with her kids, Jack came back with her camera, and uh, they brought with them something like 40 participants. <laughs> we had a giant group of student teachers from the local university, and we also, uh, did the pictures come up? No, Let's they see. were there. Oh, they were there. Okay, great. Oh, great. So that's, those are uh, Elena's daughters. As of a couple years ago, they're both quite a bit taller now. <laughs> and um, then we have this group of students from a high school. Um, so you see uh, second to the right there is Oscar Lancaster. He's a high school arts and sports teacher in the town, born and raised in Nogales. And he brought some of his students with him. And this was another big turning point from a dramaturgical perspective in terms of what we were doing. That these students came, and at first they were kind of like, oh, you know, our teacher's making us be here. We're teenage boys. They were like flirting with us. And <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. We were having a blast. And, um, you know, they come from, as Oscar describes it, one of the more challenged schools in the city where people, they hear a narrative all the time of like, life here is terrible, there's nothing in the future for you. And I was like, I don't speak any Spanish. Necesito un amigo. Do you know, power drill, are you cool with here? Make holes here and here, I trust you, go. And um, over the course of a couple days, they actually got super engaged and were really excited just by, I think, virtue of being trusted. They re-engineered part of our design and made it way better. We still use their, their improvements today. Mm -hmm. um, they've come back to help us lead puppetry workshops before, and we're still in touch with these guys, and they still help us out all the time. Um, so that was another big turning point for us when we were like, okay, teenagers are really good participants for this project. This is particular meaning to these guys, and how can we, in our next steps, get them involved more deeply? I'm going too slow. I'm going to speed up a little. Um, we, at the same time, had, uh, so we got to the day of the festival. We had five puppets built. There we go. Um, so that's Floor. That's the prototype that Anna and I built in New York, being puppeteered by some folks. Uh, I think I put timers on these, so more photos will come. I'll just let them roll. Um, we set up two different spots for the puppets to start, one on either side, and they took a route uh, along the wall, met at one point at the wall next to one of the pedestrian gates, had a little party, waved to each other through the wall, um, and then took a walk along the wall together to a second site, which will come up in a minute or two when that photo gets there. Um, so this is them walking along. Uh, you can see that kind of tan peachy wall is what it looks like when it's right next to a pedestrian crossing or the main uh, car crossing in the area. Uh, the town, incidentally, is also where, if you've heard of the train La Bestia, it's a freight train that goes through most of Mexico and lots of people who are migrating hop on this very dangerous train ride and ride this train up through Mexico to get to the border crossing, and that's in Novelis. Um, we had a bunch of, uh, we had a meeting at one point where there was a community center, we went to chat with them and they were like, oh, we, we're some stilt walking kids, we want to be in your parade. And I was like, Anna, we don't, we don't have a parade. And she was like, I know. So I'll tell them no, and I was like, no, 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 say yes, we'll make a parade, it'll be fine. <laughs> so uh, we ended up having a whole parade, and we paraded the puppets and the kids on stilts all the way across along the wall, and we met at this second site where, as you can see, the wall, you can see through it the whole thing, and they got together, and they played, and they waved. Um, and in one of the most significant actions, again, it was very um, improvised, the whole performance, um, the most significant action they took was they reached through the wall and touched hands, and that's something that people in this town used to be able to do. Uh, people would get together with their relatives who couldn't cross and have lunch at the wall and talk to each other and touch hands through the wall and kiss. 
And um, now at this exact site, there is a pedestrian fence, so you cannot get closer to the wall than five feet. They've also installed mesh uh, along about eight feet high, I think, so you can't pass things through or reach through anymore. And now, as you may have seen in some very widely publicized photos, it's actually covered in barbed wire, giant coils of barbed wire, so you really can't get close to it. Um, and it was really meaningful to see how the puppets were able to amplify this experience that the people in the town had been engaging in. Um, now, I will say, uh, we started doing some reflecting on it, and there were definitely some challenges in that first year, um, you know, getting, talking to Stephanie and Raul about what it was like to work together. We learned a lot in terms of how, where our own ignorance was and where we could work better. Um, we started a really clear, critical, reflective practice so that we could move forward really thoughtfully. And uh, we moved into this new question, which is how can we, or can we, invite a more responsive engagement with the local participants and collaborators to deepen the rigor of the project and expand its impact? So this was what we did going into year two. Uh, we did a couple things in response to that question. The first, we started a binational pen pal program. Uh, we worked with Oscar and his students, and we contacted a local high school teacher from the Arizona side. And we've piloted it twice. We haven't quite figured it out yet, but we're uh, close to having a really, a really workable pen pal program. They uh, started with a picnic at the wall, we brought all the kids together, we did some games, and we really focused on the dramaturgical question of identity, um, because puppets are bodies, and bodies have identity. And um, so we're talking with the students about how is identity formed, what's your identity, what's unique about having a borderlander identity, and then transmuting that to what's the identity of the community? How is this community's identity formed? Is it what you think of yourselves? Is it what outsiders think of you? And how can that then be expressed with and through the puppets? Um, and then the hope was that they would be our puppet builders. Mm -hmm. um, that's another photo. So this is the same photo, uh, but from different sides. So this is from the Arizona side, and that's taken from the Mexican side. Um, we also diversified and expanded our leadership team, because the first year was like, me and Anna, <laughs> with Stephanie and with Raul. Um, last, this past year, uh, there were, as you can see, 10 of us, plus an intern. Um, we included me and Anna. Talia came on full time. Jack Subeli and Elena, who had come in and brought us all those participants the first year, they've joined us full collaborators, as has Oscar, um, and Raul stayed. And then we also found Analia Briones and Jimena Pacheco, who are both uh, Mexican, one in Mexico City and one's based in Montreal, and they both do like PR and marketing and all kinds of great stuff and geniuses. And then we met Michael Fenlison, who works in Tucson and runs a local art center nearby, and he came on board as well. So we really focused on how can we expand this leadership team as much as possible with really strong local connections, people that are awesome and really invested in this work, and who are local and have a local perspective, so that it's not just me and Anna trying to figure it out. Um, let's see. We also uh, we did one more th uh, third action in response. We decided to take 18 months before doing the next festival because we wanted a little bit more time to move forward thoughtfully. Um, so we did our second festival about six weeks ago. We did it the very first weekend of May. Um, we had, again, it was a binational festival, but we, instead of being one person running a festival, another person running a festival, and the puppets kind of tying them together, we really worked as a team to create one big festival that was binational. Um, it was all day. We invited local artists to come and show and sell their work for free. We provided them with tables, chairs, and booths, um, some of which were donated by local businesses. We had stages on both sides where we had local musicians performing. We played some films. Um, and it was really awesome. And then, of course, we had our puppets, our giant puppets. Um, let me see. Oh, the pictures aren't coming up. Okay, there's one. That's Linda, one of the puppets we built this year. Um, that's Nefis. She's a local rapper. She's performed on both stages. And we had as many musicians as possible perform on both stages. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go like two minutes over. Is that okay? Thanks. Um, and this, just for comparison, these are two of the puppets from this year. There's Linda on the right. And that's what the wall looks like now. That's the exact same site as in that picture I showed you from two years ago. Um, so it's actually the barbed wire. They've gotten a lot of press because the town feel, feels that it's unsafe and unnecessary. And uh, they're really pushing back against some of the federal government's decisions to try and bring a little bit more. Um, but again, this is part of what this project is about. That idea that like this town is a town of barbed wire. Uh, that's uh, photos of the barbed wire being installed by guys in military suits. is like the most widely shared photo of Novellas in the past year. Can I ask a super quick question? Yeah. Is the barbed wire on both sides or just no, the No, just side? the American side because we don't have, I don't believe the American side, right, yeah, I don't think we have the, the right. So on the Mexican yeah. side of the wall, it's painted and covered in art and murals. Mm -hmm. And on the American side, it's covered in barbed wire. Um, and uh, yeah. 
We also did quite a lot of critical reflecting this year um, and in the past five weeks, and that's partly why I'm here today. I'm still, as a dramaturg and creative producer and one of the leaders of the project, I'm in a period of like deep reflection, trying to figure out, okay, what can we do better? What are we not doing well? And how can I help make that happen? And how can I help facilitate that? Um, I mean, the biggest problem right now is that we've kind of fallen haphazardly into this hierarchical structure. Um, so Ana Diaz, my collaborator, Ana Diaz Barriga, she got into a PhD program, which is awesome news for us as a project, but it also means that she's had to take a big step back from being actively involved in running it on the ground because she's doing research instead. Um, and so I kind of fell into running it basically myself. And we had all these collaborators, I had all these ideas about collaborative leadership, but we didn't, we didn't embody them this year. Uh, you know, and uh, we get down there and, and you know, everyone kind of defers to me and, and partly because we function as a nonprofit through my fiscal sponsorship, which means I, the individual, have all of the fundraising responsibility and all of the financial risk, mm -hmm. which then automatically creates a hierarchy and that's a problem, uh, especially given the message of the project. Um, it was reiterated at some points during the day. There were some challenges on the Mexican side of the festival that weren't appropriately addressed because I didn't know they were there and it all fell, you know what I mean, there was too much single point of failure. And, you know, I'm only one person. There are some things that I'm not good at, like time management. Um, and so that's the biggest issue, I think, that we have right now, is how we can take a pause and look at what we've been doing. We've been looking at this as a project-based thing. And now I think it's time for us to move to be organizationally based. And how can this group of people come together and create an organizational structure that's dramaturgically sound and that's reflective of the dramaturgy of our project? Um, so our kind of key questions right now, what I'm really fixated on, um, and what I think and hope my collaborators are excited to fix it on with me is what are the strategies that we can use to make our leadership really collaborative so we can execute this work more thoughtfully and respond more deeply to the community's needs and our own artistic potential. And beneath that also, you know, what are the cultural barriers that we're not seeing and how can we uncover and navigate them more effectively? In the past uh, five weeks, I've had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with every single person on the team just to be like, lay it all out there. What was great? What was terrible? What worked? What didn't? And um, I learned a couple of things too. There were moments where like, I made cultural mistakes and I didn't know, and vice versa. Um, the language barrier is still an issue among us. It's uh, something we found some ways of navigating, but they're not great. Um, I've started taking Spanish classes, but I'm a long way away from being able to have a really nuanced conversation about organizational leadership strategies. <laughs> and so then a lot of the work of translation falls onto two of our most comfortably bilingual People. Um, Anna, my collaborator, is, is a professional translator, so the whole first year, she had this massive burden of interpreting for me that I didn't even realize, you know? And I think uh, uh, looking at what does it mean when two of the leadership team are translating for the rest of the leadership team, and are you able to listen to what I'm actually saying if you're also trying to think about how to translate it in two minutes? Um, some technological tools have been helpful. I know like Elena and I both, the language she and I, are, we can't really have a deep one-on-one -on -one conversation because of our language barrier. Facebook Messenger now auto-translates between Spanish and English, so she and I had our first one-on-one -on -one conversation about three weeks ago. Uh, but we're looking for more strategies, and I'd love to hear if anybody has some thoughts to more strategies on how we can work with our language barrier, uh, treat it less like a barrier and overcome it, treat it as an asset, um, work more bilingually, um, and you know, looking back and saying, you know, well, we've had this person, this body, this privilege at the helm for two and a half years. And who have we excluded in that process? And how can we turn and then invite them in um, and really listen? So we started these next uh, addressing these questions with those one-on-one -on -one meetings just to give everybody a safe space to really voice their concerns and um, see, kind of gather all of our learning. Um, we've talked about starting the planning for next year in September with a retreat where all of us get together for two days with like no phones and really sit down and say, cool, we're starting from the ground up, what do we actually want to be doing? And how can we structure this and create an organization? Um, and find a way towards a greater cultural understanding. So now, um, and this is uh, you know, what I'd love to put to you guys in conversation, um, what are some of these collaborative leadership models or strategies that you've found success with that I can maybe research and learn from? Um, we've done some more artistic digging. Uh, I just came from two weeks in Europe where Anna and I did a week at the Prague Quadrennial and we built three puppets with a group of international participants, uh, designers and theater folk and posed these questions to them. And then we did another festival in London with the same idea. We was an international group of participants and we talked about identity. So we're kind of finding ways in to talk about the artistic uh, questions here 
but I'd really love to get your thoughts and your thoughts on this and some of these ethical questions we're wrestling with. Thank you for letting me go over. Great, for sure. Um, great. So I'd love to move and just offer up on it. Is there anything that you just offered with this presentation that might have given an answer or another question or another dimension forthhand to all of those ethical <laughs> questions you offered up in your presentation? Uh, well, a to a, it brought to mind a totally new thing that I hadn't, that I didn't talk about, uh, but. I, when we have graduate student facilitators at the Guadalupe Center who don't speak Spanish, that's become, that became an issue. And the graduate student, because there were two or three facilitators, and one of them spoke fluent Spanish, one spoke some Spanish, and the third one spoke no Spanish. And the, the one who didn't speak Spanish had the most skills at movement and choreography. She was a dancer and choreographer and we really needed her skills, but she was kind of afraid to work with the group. Um, and that she, so somebody always had to interpret for her. Mm -hmm. um, and, and at first she didn't want the, like the interpreting seemed awkward. So then I, as dramaturg, I, I, I suddenly, this had never happened before, I don't think, but I started using my language skills as part of my dramaturgy of the project. Mm -hmm. So I, like part of my dramaturgy job was to interpret for this person. So I would say maybe a solution is just to know that you have to have an interpreter and plan yeah. for them. Mm -hmm. And maybe yeah. make it, if you have the funds, someone who's not necessarily involved in the project so that that's their only job. Mm -hmm. Right, all the funds, <laughs> always the funds. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's one of the things that, that we need to prioritize in our budget moving forward is having an, a professional interpreter who's not like a member of the leadership team be present to help us and make that communication like deeper. I was curious about the funds, the uh, financing, mm -hmm. how that works for your project. Um, so I'm fiscally sponsored as a producer through Fractured Atlas. They're awesome, plug for Fractured Atlas. Um, so we've been entirely funded by private donors and a couple uh, small grants from local organizations, local nonprofit organizations. The Southwest Folk Life Alliance uh, supported us. Um, Arizona Equality has supported us. Uh, Nogales Community Development has supported us. And everything else has been private donations. Uh, Home Depot gave us a bunch of materials this past year. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that publicly or not. Uh, the local Home Depot was very kind really and they really donated materials to us. To say that. Yeah, they were wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful. And how much um, does it cost to do this? So our first year, uh, well, both of the festivals ran at a budget of about $22,500, including in kind support. Really, to do it super well, we need like 50 just for the festival. Um, everybody who's worked on this right now is volunteer. Uh, none of us are paid, and that's a thing we'd obviously like to work towards uh, because it's a big time commitment that we're asking people to make, and this is a whole other set of ethical questions too. Inviting people into a project with a big time commitment that they're passionate about and finding ways to pay ourselves. Um, so we did uh, both years. We rented about uh, twenty-two and a half thousand, including significant in-kind support. Almost half of that was in-kind support both years. Uh, no, that's not true. Probably a third was in-kind support the first year, about half the second year. So it's a lot of. Uh, we approaching folks who we think are interested, and it's become a dramaturgical exercise as well. If our goal is to get positive media attention and turn eyes towards this practice of like radical listening and talking to people who actually live there, well, who are the donors that are out there who are interested in this issue that want more access and want to know more about this area? And then donation becomes also a tool for us to build audience and help um, further that mission. So, yeah. I'm curious to know if there's any like. Um, I just, I really uh, enjoyed your talk because I'm sitting here, these are the exact same ethical questions that we're wrestling with too, and I wonder if any of them really resonated, any of the things that you guys are, are that you're looking about in your research really resonated with this project, or if there were other ethical questions that you see that maybe we're, that I didn't talk about or that we need to be engaging. Mm, I, yeah, the one, one ethical question that comes to mind, because in my, my other job as a researcher Right, the theorist of, of performance. I, I wrote a book called, uh, perf what's it called? Perform uh, uh, Performances <laughs> of Suffering in Latin American Migration, Heroes, Martyrs, and Saints. And under contract with Paul Brink. And <laughs> look at that. Yeah, and, and uh, I bring this up not to plug my book, but because <laughs> as I researched that book, I traveled to a lot of the, the um, 
shelters for migrants in southern Mexico. And one of the issues that came up for me was a lot of how is it that I'm able to move back and forth very mm -hmm. easily and the people who I'm interviewing for this book are, are stuck in a super dangerous situation. Um, and what are the ethics of that? So I wondered when you were talking about doing the activities and seeing the beautiful photos of people on both sides of the wall, it seems like a great project. I love the project. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'd like to go next time. Mm -hmm. You got it. I'd love to have you. But so I was wondering whether among those people who attend, who can move back and forth across the wall yeah. and who can't? It's a really big question and it's something that we can highlight. The first year, uh, our goal was to have like the festival happening simultaneously on both sides so people can move freely back, like move back and forth. Um, and have it really be one united festival. That did not happen the first year. We had the festival on one side in the afternoon and the other side in the evening, and almost no one crossed through because they were like, oh, we didn't know to bring our passports. Um, but this question of uh, freedom of movement is a huge, huge question for us and how we can work with the people we're working with at the government level to try and facilitate that a little more. We've still never been able to get all our pen pal kids in the same room at the same time because we've not been able to get humanitarian visas. Um, they're available, it's just hard these days, and it's a really volatile situation. And it's something that we encountered that, again, like, like your privilege, I didn't even think about, like, on a how to work for you so legally, but our experience that first year of me being like, no, no, we'll just cross back and forth. We'll go there today, and then we'll go back tomorrow. And Anna was really uncomfortable about it. And I was like, why? You have a visa. But her experience of it was so different than my experience. Right, right. And the fact that, like, going into the Mexico side, there's like, there's, like, a metal detector that they kind of look at. And on the U.S. side, you wait in line for three hours, and they interview you. And so, like, it's it's a huge question that we just um, we've it's come up as a barrier in the work, and I haven't yet figured out how dramaturgically to invite it into the work mm -hmm. in an artistic way. Um, yeah, I think that might make that yeah. could be a very powerful <coughs> yeah. statement if you find a way to incorporate it. Thank you. That's a really great idea. So here we have two presentations that are very much in conversation with each other. <laughs> and two presenters who have illustrated that by being in conversation. <laughs> which is so thrilling to watch and thank you so much. And now I think is the time to turn it out yeah. toward the audience. And you've been given some questions that are illustrated on the floor. Some questions about project and participants and topics and communication. This is my abbreviated yeah. <laughs> most massive uh, questions, questions, resources, ideas. So um, yeah, usually we ask the audience to ask you questions, but no, we're going to turn it on you, and you have to answer. <laughs> I feel you can ask us questions. I can't speak for you. I'm happy to answer questions too. Yeah, um, but yeah. yeah really curious to know what knowledge is in this room so know, that we can share. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Just uh, in regards to like simultaneous performance, mm -hmm. um, since that movement is such an issue because some people have the ability yeah. um, and the privilege to go both ways. Perhaps um, there could be a projected live stream, um, which also brings the idea of this aspect of distance and not even being able to fully connect with both sides, which is also need to really address. Um, because uh, I'm actually very curious on, for your guys' team and like, collaborators, mm -hmm. How many people have actually lived or spent time in those communities long term that can accurately yeah. represent? Yeah. Because um, I think it is really important that you guys are, are that everyone is going to the communities and having this like full wall approach of asking them what they would like and then representing. Yeah. But outside of the room, who is actually involved in that? Yeah, so right now our leadership team, and again, this is part of why we need to move towards a more collaborative model. Right now, um, we have me, Talia, Anna, and Jimena, who are not from the area. Um, and then from the area, uh, Oscar's born and raised, Jack is born and raised, Elena's born and raised, uh, Michael lives about an hour away, um, and then, I'm forgetting people, um, Analia is uh, living in Mexico City, but from Sonora, so she's from the borderlands. So again, we've been really working hard to, to invite local people into leadership and into any other position that we have anytime we need to hire a photographer or hire a graphic designer. We're really looking to invest in people locally and meet people locally and make sure that those perspectives are centered. Um, but again, one of the things that I don't think we did this year was decenter me as the face of the project. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing that we're trying to find a better way to do or that I'm trying to find a better way to do. Because mm -hmm. uh, we have this great diverse leadership team, but I'm the one doing all the interviews and trying to, you know, but so yeah, it's an ongoing, ongoing practice. Why 
awesome. I'm excited for your offer. Um, I think the biggest thing that's centering me that way this year was that I was the instigating artist and that I have all the financial responsibility. And I think because I had all the financial responsibility and was, as the instigator, leading our meetings, um, you know, I get down there, Ana Lia calls me jefita. And so, you know, anytime there was a question, I would turn and say, well, what do you guys think about that? What do you guys think about that? And the response would be, oh, uh, I think this, but it's your call. You're the producer of the event. And so um, I think it's partly also time. We were really up against time. And with one person having too much of the responsibility, um, and again, I think that's part of uh, my experience as a leader also brought us to a place where I was like, I had too much of the information just like in my brain and hadn't delegated and hadn't shared. Um, so I think a lot of that is me reflecting on my own abilities and processes as a leader and how I can improve. And I think that's part of why that happened. Um, I also think from a press perspective, uh, uh, on the US side, it's less of an issue. On the Mexican side, uh, uh, a lot of the press we got, like, I'm the draw in a way. Like, oh, it's this producer from New York who's coming, and that's part of what the story's about. And so they often want to center me in the story because I'm, I'm not local. Um, and so it's, again, a question of me being like, no, 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 I can't do this by myself. And that's where our language barrier sometimes becomes an asset because then I can insist that we have other members of our leadership team be present with me. Mm -hmm. Oh, because, you know, my Spanish is just not good enough. So uh, I'd love to hear your offer. Well, I've, I've lost some leadership team talking at a time. Yes, but, please. Because um, that's what he says, which is like, what mm -hmm. Uh, they have a beautiful model called the kind of quote, which means stamp. And so there's a rotating leadership model that is employed where everybody, I mean, I, I mean this is a reduction of the actual practice, but you know, you can imagine yourself as a small community, this project, and there are many ways I think to implement it in the context of small scale collaboration of like this, uh, wherein leadership is either shared on a time structure, so uh, each person occupies a, a, a particular role of leadership for a particular um, period of time, not uh, can demystify um, mm -hmm. what goes into leadership, and it can also um, demystify responsibility, it can uh, break down uh, the kind of centrality of power that can sometimes have. Yeah. Um, but I also think, I, and I'm curious because you didn't speak to it, and I'm sure that you all have started doing some of them, but some of them also, it's like the assumption, right, that you're just like, oh, I'm a dramaturg and I'm good at making agendas, so I'll just get this done. And there was a lot of, we're under time pressure, so I'll just get this done, I'll just get this done. And also a lot of guilt at knowing that like none of us were getting paid, and I was like, oh, I don't want to ask them to do this mundane task, because they have other things to do, and like, and so then I think that I centered myself inadvertently by trying to like lighten the burden on other people instead of trusting my collaborators to tell me what they were excited about and what they could do. And it's another thing we've been thinking about. Um, everybody did have like a formal role with a title this past year um, based on you know where we saw them situated and what their skill set was. And now that we're getting to know ourselves and each other better too, we're able to better see like who's really good at what and what things, you know, who should be in charge of different things based on their skill set and their interests. Uh, can we get her questions on the board? Because I'm going to confess not remembering what they are. Yeah, hold on. I can totally do that. And I have yours up there. Um, but yes. I think we just have them right there. Uh -huh. Is there a, yeah, can we write them? Well, I wonder. I'm like, this is a white it? board behind this. Oh, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Participants. 
Exactly. Or recruit, yeah, Mr. Ray, just recruit, recruit participants how? And then pay them question. Pay the undocumented question. How much do you pay them? Mm -hmm. I had a lot of questions. Um, <laughs> uh, what was the and third and when, when do you tell them that you're gonna pay them? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, the third question was how do you decide the topic of the production and the power power the choice between the celebratory and the what can we call it the aggressive or the yeah. the celebratory and the confrontational or mm -hmm. and then uh, the, there's a minor question so questionnaire is uh, power balance between participants and facilitators deciding mm -hmm. topics. And then the fourth question was communication. How do you communicate with participants? How, within what structure, what rules, who sets the rules for communicating? Yeah. Do we just let the university's most restrictive policy apply? Or do we have some sort of conversation with the participants where they themselves get some say in what the communication policy is? Can, is this, can you see this? And yes, thank you, that's great. great. And there's a fifth one actually that I didn't talk about at all mm -hmm. um, with, because we're not there yet with our project, yeah. but that would be the exit strategy. Mm -hmm. All right, so thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so this question I have is specifically sparked by, by your conversation, but I am curious to what you would both say about it in relation to your projects. Mm -hmm. um, what type of ownership, especially because now your project has had a few years, mm -hmm. it's had two years, so like what type of ownership do the repeat participants have in creating some of those materials, structures, practices themselves? And how does that, you know, maybe take some of the burden off of you? Or like how does that inform the work and how does their ownership help um, create the, the projects? Um, it's uh, pretty simple for us. Um, as far as the teenage participants, we haven't had too much uh, overlap between the two years. Um, the guys that came back from the first year were kind of like workshop leaders. They kind of, you know, like kind of took the helm. Um, and then the adult participants who came back are the people who we've moved, who have moved into like real true collaborator positions, Oscar and Jack and Elena. Um, and they've really become full collaborators of the project and, and members of the, what I would call the leadership team. Um, and it's having a significant impact on the project and how we move forward, so. I think it, in our case it differed from group to group. Mm -hmm. um, and we had five groups the first year and then that was all too much. For, and so the second year we, we scaled back to three groups. Um, and at the YMCA, the senior citizens, uh, it was, there was a lot of repeat participants, but they're very kind of respectful of the facilitators. They're sort of like, yeah, mm -hmm. we'll do whatever you tell us, just mm -hmm. tell us what to do. Um, whereas at the Guadalupe Center and at the, the Hilltop Public Library group with the teens, there's much more input. And APTP taught us a bunch of techniques for generating material from participants. So even if, even if the senior citizens are sort of like passive in the sense that they're not going to come up, they're not going to just start chatting about their lives, but they'll have like a walk your life kind of exercise where they have five different events that happened in their lives and will go to five different parts of the room and begin to make gestures and movements that express something about those events. And so those sorts of activities give them a lot of ownership of that. But as far as like, are they going to continue this activity if we stop offering this as a class in the YMCA? I doubt it. Mm -hmm. um, at the other end, at the other extreme, at the Hilltop Public Library, mm -hmm. the youth wanted to do something during the summer and during up until January, because we do this primarily as an activity during the second, the spring semester, which starts in January through April, May, of, you know, at the OSU semester, because it has to be tied to a class for graduate students. Um, but the, they wanted so badly to continue to do this activity that they started their own group and they called mm -hmm. it GHOST, which is an acronym for something I forget. Um, <laughs> but with their, the community 
partner there is a librarian who uh, was a theater major at OSU um, years ago. So she has the skills to help a group like that and facilitate that group even if nobody from OSU is around. And that's very convenient. At the high school, the high school teacher also was a theater graduate from OSU. And he had those skills, but then he went to a high school in a rich neighborhood and mm -hmm. left the project. Um, so that was, that was sad because he could have carried on with those techniques. And he was fascinated because he'd had a much more traditional like script kind of training, script-based training in acting and performance in theater. That was almost his whole idea of theater except for improvising. So this whole idea of devising with untrained actors from their own material and creating your own script was, he loved them. Did that answer your question? I like yeah, I was just curious about the division of, of the roles. Yeah, but I do think, I do think that the, the team group, there's a big need for that. And I think that if one of the groups goes on and without us, it would be that one. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts in response? Yeah. I had a different question, sorry. Oh, no, 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 it's okay. I just wanted to ask um, if each of you sought legal counsel, and if so, can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, did you feel the need to do that, working within the university, working through, you know, like the legal yeah. office in the university? Or anything? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't seek legal counsel, mm -hmm. but the university told me I had to have legal counsel. So there's <laughs> there's a lawyer from the university that vets every consent form, every agreement with participants, the, uh, the contract for the payment, everything, and advises on anything we want to advise on, and sometimes things we don't want to advise on. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to work through that all? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and for us, um, yes, but in a myriad of different ways that mm -hmm. don't necessarily include hiring lawyers. Uh -huh. um, we did seek legal counsel for Hannah's visa, of course, the first time, because we didn't know what the process was. Um, and we ran a couple like brief questions by them, but primarily the legal advice we've gotten has been from Border Patrol and from Homeland Security and just me going and saying, what are the legal considerations? What do we need to consider? Um, and then through Factored Atlas, then we have access to some resources like for insurance and just being able to talk to them and say, like, here's what we're doing. What kind of insurance do we need? What kind of protections do we need? Cool, can you help us, can you sell that to me, please? Um, so and we've uh, turned to lots of friends in various um, political activist positions because we are such an activist, uh, we're affiliated with a lot of activist groups. We are, there's no such thing as apolitical, but our goal is to not like, we don't have a political agenda per se, um, but we're working with a lot of political groups who have lawyers among them and who've done similar things. So we kind of skirted the legal costs by leaning on our community. Thank you. Yeah, I had a question. In, in terms of um, the coverage from the media of the project, how did that, did that translate into an effect in, in terms of either local politics or Arizona politics in general? Um, not yet. I, don't, I can't say that we personally have had like, a strong uh, political impact or outcome. Um, but I think the coverage we've gotten, we've, we've started to get some nice traction. We had a blogger wrote an article about us on HuffPo, we've had NPR, we've had BBC interest, we've had PBS interest. So I, I do think it's kind of telling which news outlets are interested in covering us um, and who's reaching out to us. Um, and I think a lot of outside media, uh, it's interesting that we've had a lot of local press um, that we've pursued. And then a lot of our wider statewide and national level press um, inquiries are coming to me from national level organizations who are trying to find positive angles or artistic angles on this town that's the center of so much fraught press and so they google and they find us and they call me <laughs> and then i'm like cool well here are all the people locally that you should be calling um but yeah i don't think we, we haven't quite gotten there it is one of our goals to not necessarily uh, create a specific political outcome but to spark conversation and create a space for conversation that we think is not necessarily happening on the national level um, and the long-term goal for us is a network of border festivals that happen all along the U.S.-Mexico border simultaneously, so that 10 years from now, this is a thing that happens every weekend of May, whatever, that all of the border town festivals come together, celebrate, and show a positive side of life in the border. Um, and hopefully that would spark a direct person-to-person -person communication, which maybe would then have a trickle-down effect into actual politics. But we're, I think we're more focused on like one-to-one person-to-person -to -person communication rather than a bigger political outcome. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. 
any other thoughts and responses to these questions? They don't necessarily have to be answers, but rather, I've also yeah. worked in device or community right. engagement, and here's something that we found was successful. Yeah. And here's my experience. Any of that in the room? Mm -hmm. um, just uh, regarding a question about um, the texting mm -hmm. and the, that sort of yeah. personal relationship. Um, yeah. I. I don't know, I find it really interesting, and there's a company where I'm from, I'm from Calgary, Canada, um, and uh, and they, it's a disarts company, um, and it's a small company, and it's so, dis -arts. Um, like mad disarts disabled uh, artists, um, and so there aren't like sometimes clear boundaries, mm -hmm. um, and so that artistic director has told me that they have the same, same thing happen a lot. So they become, you know, like a really important person in like their artist lives. Um, and so what they're looking to do is hire like a permanent position mm -hmm. in their company as like counselor or outreach person whose job is specifically to take that on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I worked with a similar model um, the City Spotlights program in Boston, mm -hmm. where we, it was a group of teens um, that we were working with, and I was a teaching artist there, and I wasn't allowed to have any social media contact with the kids, but we had somebody who was trained in, uh, registered in drama therapy and, L and was an LCSW, mm -hmm. and she was, and she was a, like a younger person, she was like fresh out of grad school, and she was designated as like teen advocate, Mm -hmm. And essentially she was like the guidance counselor slash cool older sister that they would all go to. <laughs> but they could text her because and go to her with any of the problems. And if any of the teens came to us and were like trying to reach out that way, we'd be like, oh, go talk to Carmen. She's like, she'll take care of that for you. Mm -hmm. And if she doesn't, like, let me know and I'll try and find somebody else for you. But it was, yeah, we had a designated person and that model worked really well. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting idea. And she was also a teaching artist too. She did workshops as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have the same issue with my ethnographic research too. When I like talk to interview someone who's trying to cross Mexico and go to the United States, mm -hmm. uh, and they're undocumented, and they ask something like, uh, "Do you have a place where I could stay, mm -hmm. or can you give me some money?" Right? What's um, oh no, I'm just a researcher, I'm just here to take your story mm -hmm. and then go away, doesn't really seem like the appropriate response. And that's always the institutional response. And, uh, and part of me thinks that's a, a good idea to have a designated person, but the other part of me is like, but they're, they're reaching out to you, mm -hmm. and aren't you kind of saying, coming up with like a policy or, or a designated other person who's gonna handle it? I seems a I don't know. I think it's about having like the appropriate resources available. Yeah. Because yeah. like I totally hear you. Um, you know, we're we're drawn to so we have empathy and we want to help people. Um, but you know, imagine if you get asked that over and over again. Sure. You know, like yeah. you can't help everyone. I can't yeah. have ten kids texting me all the time. If it, yeah. if it had been more than one, I probably would have told yeah. them to stop. Well, and that's something that we do too, is we've got, we have a couple, a part of what we've done is like find local partners who we can say, oh, well, I know someone you can talk to. So it's not just like, oh, you should go to this organization, but you should go to this organization and talk to, talk to Ms. Jones, or you should go to this organization and talk to Pancho, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that we can point them and connect them to a specific person. I found a little bit more success with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wanted to say, Jess, when you brought up liminal space, mm -hmm. um, and this is sort of a big idea, but um, I like that they, yeah, and I mean, I use that a lot in my classroom when I'm teaching playwriting or screenwriting, um, that, that that idea that, some, you know, a liminal space is, it doesn't have borders, and yet this liminal space is, yeah. is, is saying, yes, there's this huge border now. And that just in terms of media or the big idea around it and how the conversations are happening in between artists, that this, this metaphor and this idea, I mean, even the liminal space, like when people are wanting to text you, like is that, it's a permeable boundary once you start having an emotional 
connection, you're never going to get away from that. It's never, that's never going to disappear. And so yes, it's got to be regulated, but um, the metaphor of it is so fascinating to me. And I, I imagine there's ways into creating more um, interest. I mean, it's an anthropological idea. It's a, it's a psychological, it's a psycho-spiritual. It gets into so many areas that seem so, I mean, yes, we're talking about boots on the ground stuff, but when we lift up and we start to, you know, how do we draw people's attention to, yeah. to this, that whole concept of liminal space, and, you know, that's in between dream time and waking. That's, that's yeah. the liminal space between dawn and, and day and, and sunset and all the animals that come out at those times, you know, there's, and your puppet, you know, so that's kind of what took my attention as well. And that actually, when you talk, when you can find a way to bring that in, grantors actually like it. Yes, they yeah. want, <laughs> you know, they want, or at least I found that. They, they want those hard numbers and they want the facts and all that stuff. But when you can lift it up and say, this is actually what we're talking about in terms of our, you know, our kind of um, mythic, if we're going to talk about, you know, we're in a revolutionary time and people, so that's, I just wanted to throw that in. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it comes up a lot in the, when we work with the teenagers, um, I think it manifests, we have this question of like, in what way is this one Nogales, and in what way is it two? Mm -hmm. Because it's not, is it one or is it two? We started with that question, do you think it's one town or do you think it's two towns? But it's, it's not that, it's in what way is it this and this, and that they're both at the same time overlapping and existing. Yeah. So. I think that applies to the Columbus factors too. Yeah. I mean, they're not Absolutely. a wall burning through it, but they're sort of, what is that relation? And, and I don't is know. Is it one thing or another? I don't know if, if what the way you're using liminal has anything to do with Victor Turner and his the anthropologist. Of the yeah. um, no, it has everything to do with a, a smarter, more educated person than me saying your project's about liminal space. And <laughs> <laughs> it's really good, and from what I've understood of it so far, it's appropriate. So. <laughs> well, you can check out Victor Turner if you're interested, and he he talks about the liminal as like a stage and rituals mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. you go from like. Uh, being a child to being yeah. uh, mm -hmm. an adult, right? And you, ha you have the bar, bar mitzvah, oh, and yeah. then, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's the ritual that marks like the end of the liminal. So, so for Victor Turner, there was the liminal was a stage that you go beyond that you trans. Yes. What's the word? Trans? Not transgress, but transcend. You, transcend. transcend. Thank yeah. you. Um, and that's not happening on the board, unfortunately. Right, and I think it is kind of what we're trying to promote. And it's really interesting, especially considering that we're working with young people. Uh, we have a lot of juniors and seniors too, and this is something they've done with us, like right before they go to college, so they're in the in a liminal space for themselves as I mean, well. great, like yeah. I, I was thinking, brainstorming, like yeah. the idea of outgrowing a border. Like mm -hmm. is there a way which we could make the border a liminal space, mm -hmm. literally, yeah. and that there could be, could we imagine a time when we don't need the border? And I think if there's any political agenda in this work, it's that you know we're coming to start to ask this question globally too, as like a global community. In what ways are we outgrowing borders as human beings? Are we? Maybe we're not quite yet. We try not on one more question in the conversation though. That might. Hi, thank you both so much for speaking. Um, I come at this from a couple of different perspectives. Um, when I was 18, I was actually part of a community theater. Um, uh, initiative where if, uh, a bunch of really established artists, um, the Via the Canvas is called the Amy Project, where women who are established artists come in and help mentor. Um, in this case, we were vulnerable uh, women at the end of high school from a variety of different backgrounds, so I've actually benefited from these kinds of programs. <coughs> and, um, just to sort of touch on uh, this idea of like having someone who is specially there to correspond with these students or with these young people, you have to remember it protects you as well as it protects them. Mm -hmm. And something that I wish that I had had when I was 18 and some of my peers had had was someone who was there. Um, and also I was very attached to my mentor and felt like very connected to her, but she was also you know, a working artist on the rise to becoming a national playwright, you know? And so I think, I think we need to also think of it as we're protecting ourselves and protecting and we do deserve that kind of tenant. Um, so I just wanted to plant that in your, mm. in your heads. Obviously, like I would 
it wasn't necessarily a liberal community, but we were a vulnerable community of people. And um, and uh, when I look back on it, that's something that I think about a lot. So, sure. Thank you. You're welcome. I, I'm curious to the extent that you want to share more about that. Like, did you feel like communicate? You communicated with this mentor outside of the process, or you didn't? We or? did, but it was inconsistent. Like sometimes mm -hmm. I'd email her and I'd want to tell her about how I was feeling, and also sometimes she didn't respond. And some of some of my peers got a lot more responsive mentors, and then as a result, like all of us were vulnerable in different ways and for different reasons. Um, so it actually kind of like exacerbated certain mental health issues that like some of us hadn't yet addressed because why is it that like my peer here is like getting all this attention or care and like this is sort of the model between me and my mentor. Mm -hmm. And so I think it sort of allows for an equal playing field, which I really like, where it's not it's it's just like it's not about like being you know, feeling like you're comparing yourself, and especially as a young person, you're so vulnerable to that. Mm -hmm. And especially someone coming in to quote unquote help you mm -hmm. and empower you. The last thing you want to be doing is feeling like the way you're being helped and empowered is a point of contention or a point of competition or comparison. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something we all really struggled with collectively. And um, I so the people who got more attention felt like some, or the people who got less attention felt like it was somehow their fault that they were getting less yeah. attention because they yeah. weren't as attractive to the mentors. Mm -hmm. Totally. Or like even when we were, like I was seven, I was seventeen. So like in some ways, a lot. I mean, range in age, like we were between I'd say seventeen and twenty-four, and so some of the folks were like had language already to talk about their needs. And me as a seventeen-year-old with, with some other folks who were around the same age. We didn't have that language. We were just like, someone's coming here to like do this beautiful theater adventure and help us learn how to use our voices. And then that incredible, because um, it was incredible for us. But um, I just feel that's something that you know I look back on, and it's something that I was vulnerable to, and my peers again were vulnerable to again and again with like people who are established artists who wanted to do good and who did do good for us, who didn't know how to regulate that and give us an equal playing field so that we didn't take any of it personally. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think it also protects them. Like, as I'm getting into this role of being a mentor myself and having that privilege, feeling so honored by that, um, really thinking about the boundaries and the ways that I can honor and protect the people that I'm, that I'm there for. So, and it just, just dawned on me today. I was like, oh yeah, like I've been at this program saved my life, you know, 10 mm -hmm. years ago. So, um, and it did, but it still had those challenges. So, if you have any other further questions, too, I just don't have emotional room to talk about it today. But it's thank you. Email. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, no problem. And Amy Project now in Toronto, I'm not associated with it, but they they do incredible work, and I, I hope that they're from around. It's called so. Amy Project. Yeah, artist mentoring youth, and it's now not just about women mentoring women, but it's about non-binary trans folks also in the community mentoring and. They create theater together. It's an incredible initiative. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your welcome. story. Thanks for sharing my resource too. It's yeah, really no problem. And I'm, I don't, you know, I'm sure other folks here might have been beneficiaries of these programs. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking that to heart. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. You're welcome. <coughs> Big thank you for all of you. Can we get a round of applause. <laughs>